Uh, good evening. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. This is not too loud. Okay. Um, welcome. And the purpose of tonight is to introduce you to um, the report that GVSHP, Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, although they've begun, begun wisely to call themselves Village Preservation, um, which is a little bit less of a mouthful. Uh, anyway, some years ago, it was 2011, something like that, uh, Andrew Berman of GVSHB asked me if I would write a report on the history and architecture of the East Village. At that time, GVSHP was um, interested in um, sort of ascertaining whether there are por were portions of the East Village worthy of historic district designation, or even if there were individual buildings in the East Village that had not been designated as individual landmarks, but that might be. And so the purpose of my report was to do a systematic survey of the East Village, sort of block by block, building by building, and write up my findings. This is, by the way, what I do for a living. And, um, and I did it, and the report was published at the end of last year. Some of you have seen it. Uh, as Ariel told you, you can purchase a bound copy if you want this to be a permanent part of your book collection, uh, or you could download the PDF for free from the GVSHP website, and I urge you to do one or the other. Um, I think the report's pretty good, <laughs> now, if, I, if I do say so myself. And so tonight, uh, I was asked if I would give a talk sort of um, introducing the subject matter to you, the East Village and its architecture. I was given no guidelines uh, whatsoever about uh, what to say, and so it's gonna be kinda all over the place. Uh, but that's appropriate, because the East Village is all over the place, and that's what makes it so interesting. It's unique among New York City neighborhoods, and in fact, when I was first asked to do this report, I thought, oh boy, this is pretty daunting. I mean, this is not Brooklyn Heights, right? Uh, where, you know, every house is of uh, great architectural distinction. I actually am holding my hat under my arm that, uh, because I have nowhere to put it. Thank you. Um, and, um, um, it, it's a, you know, the East Village for the architecture buff has always seemed to be a peculiarly uh, difficult to grasp part of New York. It does not contain um, masterpieces, uh, nor does it contain even very much in the way of coherent streetscapes. It's a little bit, and this is not a judgmental word at all. In fact, I use this word approvingly a lot of the time, motley. <laughs> and we all know this. It's part of what draws us to the East Village. And I should preface everything that I'm going to say tonight with, I was drawn to the East Village mightily. When I first moved to New York, which was <clears throat> 40 years ago, um, the East Village was sort of the center of everything for me. The things that I was most interested in, the music and film, um, this was where you found the Poetry Project, it's where you found Café La Bama, it's where you found anthology film archives, and it was really kind of the center of the whole American culture that I was most interested in at that time, and in fact still am, and so I spent a lot of time in the East Village. 
Uh, coming from elsewhere in the country, I could not believe that there was a place where there were like retail stores that sold marijuana uh, and so on and so forth. That was the East Village and it was kind of um, a very much um, a wonderland for a young person with the sort of background that I brought with me to New York. Uh, and over the years, I've spent a lot of time in the East Village, and I've looked hard at the East Village and at its architecture and studied its history, and my findings are in the report and in tonight's lecture. Now, I'm going to start out a little boringly. I'm going to be talking about houses. I want to talk about some of the building types that you find in the East Village, and then I want to talk a little bit. And this is all going to be very briefly each one of these sections, so don't worry if this sounds like it's going to go on all night. It's not. I want to talk about some of the historical periods of the East Village, and then I want to talk about Tompkins Square, which is a, a subject of, of great fascination for me. You look at this house, and it's a house that you all know. It's a house that everybody who's interested in New York architecture or history knows. Uh, the Stuyvesant Fish House, it is sometimes called. Home of Nicholas Fish and Elizabeth Stuyvesant. They were like New York's power couple of the early 19th century. They truly were. Uh, their social pedigree was as good as it gets. Uh, Nicholas Fish was one of the closest friends of Alexander Hamilton, who is everybody's favorite American now. Uh, and, um, and they named, uh, Nicholas and Elizabeth did their son, they named Hamilton after uh, Nicholas's friend, Hamilton Fish, who became governor of New York and grew up in this house. Anyway, this is what a very rich and powerful couple's house looked like in New York, 1803-04. Modest, exceedingly modest. I mean, this was like the last time that rich people lived modestly. Uh, and and, and they, they, they did so very modestly, very tastefully. This is a picture-perfect, textbook, federal-style row house with all the features that we expect in such a house, such as the uh, fan light over the door, the slender columns with the side lights, the Flemish bond brickwork, the dormer windows, the six over six sash, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, as I say, modest. Now, when you look at this, this is also what we characterize as a federal style house, but it's almost 30 years after the house on uh, Stuyvesant Street that we just saw. This is 20 St. Mark's Place, the Daniel Leroy House. Leroy was a very prosperous New Yorker. The Leroys were a major South Street merchant family. Um, and so again, very, very well to do. Please note the date, 1832. Now, when the Stuyvesant Fish House was built, that part of New York was, that, that was really the northernmost edge of development in New York City, circa 1804. Uh, and, uh, and it was almost rural. However, by 1832, things had changed. There had been improvements in transportation and roads, the introduction of first omnibus and then horse car service, and so on, meaning that this part of the city uh, was really a functional commuter suburb and a very prosperous one. Indeed, with the development of horse cars, the most revolutionary, um, innovation in urban transportation history. Um, it meant that this, there was sort of like a, a lateral swath across Manhattan that took in Washington Square and Lafayette Place 
as Lafayette Street was once called, and St. Mark's Place. Uh, on St. Mark's Place, the principal developer was a fellow named Thomas E. Davis. He had purchased land from the Stuyvesant estate because this had all been part of what once was the Stuyvesant family farm. In any event, the houses that went up, unusually wide and deep and very nice houses in the 1830s were the sort of creme de la creme of New York real estate at that time. And when you look at this house, you see a house which is uh, more imposing and grander than the Stuyvesant Fish House. This house has that sort of really kind of in-your-face marble doorway surround with the rusticated blocks that we call a Gibbs surround after an English architect named James Gibbs. It has fancier lintels, these pointed molded lintels, and whatnot, and it's a little bit more ostentatious. By our standards today, it's still, you know, somewhat modest, but it's altogether more ostentatious than that. And a very similar house would be the 29 East 4th Street, what we all know and love as the Merchant's House Museum. Um, it's a very similar house to the 20 St. Mark's Place, and uh, more intact. It has a lot more of its detail, such as in the fan light, um, where the, the pastry chefs had at it. Um, and uh, you see, again, this is late federal, and what late federal means in this period of tremendous prosperity for New York, following the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825, uh, we're, we're, the city is changing. Uh, the, the rich are sort of imposing their will on the city a little bit more than had been the case. Here we see a map of the city, and I've indicated where in the 1830s uh, all of the fancy development was taking place. Washington Square, Lafayette Place, St. Mark's Place. So that part of the East Village, at least, St. Mark's Place, originated as an urban neighborhood, as a very well-to-do urban neighborhood. Uh, it was comparable to Washington Square North. That's 1832-33. Look at these dates. 1832-33, LaGrange Terrace on Lafayette Place, 1832. And on St. Mark's Place, these houses built by Thomas E. Davis, 1831-1832. So, obviously, something's really going on around that time. Now, here's a house which is very similar to the 20 St. Mark's Place. 20 St. Mark's Place has its stoop on the right. This house has its stoop on the left. And you may think that experts in New York City architecture would be able to tell you very readily why some houses have the stoop on the left and some on the right. And I'm here to tell you that no one knows. <laughs> Seriously, no one knows. And I say this having been through a long discussion of the topic with several of the most knowledgeable people about New York City architecture. When Christopher Gray doesn't know, Andrew Dolcart doesn't know, Bob Stern doesn't know, my friend who designs traditional brownstones as infill in historic districts doesn't know, doesn't know why he puts the stoop on the left or on the right. Then it, it, it remains one of the mysteries. Just in case you think you know, if you think it's because of the incline of the street or the angle of the sun, or the arrangement of utility lines. No, none of those work. Uh, so, so, so we don't know. In any event, my own theory is it's whether the builder is left-handed or right-handed. Uh, but in any event, this house has the stoop on the left. And some of you know this house. I call it the Alexander Hamilton house. It actually was the house of Alexander Hamilton, Jr. 
but he lived here with his mother, everybody's favorite historical American woman, Eliza Schuyler. If you've seen Hamilton, you know, she, gets, she gets cheers from the audience. Uh, in any way, uh, she lived here. She was like the Jackie Kennedy of her time. So you know that this was obviously a fancy part of town, right? Okay. Well, this house uh, was designated as a landmark while it looked like this. Now, 20 St. Mark's Place was one of the earliest designated landmarks in the city. It was designated around 1966 or so, shortly after the law was enacted. And the reason for that is that the commission, in its infancy, was very eager to sort of save uh, all the, the stuff that had somehow miraculously survived intact. Um, and this had not survived intact. So the commission didn't even consider for St. Mark's Place back in the mid-60s. And it wasn't until just a few years ago that the commission uh, began uh, to look at this house and realize that you know, it's worthy of preservation. Uh, that, in fact, a fairly good deal of its original fabric is still there so that you can by sort of stepping back and maybe squinting, you could tell that this was just as impressive in its day as 20 St. Mark's Place. But even the changes that were made, the argument was made before the commission, were a kind of text that told us about changes in the neighborhood over the years, that a fairly large amount of the neighborhood's history could be read out of this facade. That, indeed, is what I myself argued at the time, that that's what made it worthy of preservation. Well, um, that may be, uh, but the commission allowed the current owner to restore it. Uh, so much for that text telling us about the history of the neighborhood. It now looks like um, the 1830s again. Uh, and this is what it looks like now. That's what it looked like yesterday. This is what it looks like today. Um, this is another Davis house on 7th Street. Now, St. Mark's Place was the show place street. 7th Street was a little bit more modest. It was nice. It was desirable. But the houses were, as you can see here, just a little more modest. Second Avenue was also a showplace street, like St. Mark's Place. And this is the sort of thing I love, the sort of thing that I've grown to love as a lover of New York architecture. Here's a house which belonged to a merchant, a very rich merchant, Duncan, Duncan, uh, Duncan Pearsall Campbell, married to one of the Bayard girls. And when you look at this, you can see obviously how much of its original fabric is intact. You see that, I'm sorry, the lighting in the room, there's a lot of sort of ambient lighting which might be washing out some of the detail in the slides, and I apologize for that. But it has that uh, doorway surround which is very similar to 20 St. Mark's Place or to the Merchant's House Museum. Uh, and it reads, it still reads as a grand house of the 1830s, and yet the exigencies of Second Avenue over the years have meant that what was once a residential thoroughfare has become a commercial thoroughfare, and so what do you do? Your options are two in a case like that. You can tear down the old house and build a retail structure, a purpose-built retail structure, or you can remodel the old house into a retail structure. And that can be done one of two ways. It can be done sensitively or insensitively. And that's what you need to do when you look at buildings like this. You need to not say, oh, it's so awful that they wrecked it by putting up care plus 
by CVS in the, in the base of it. Uh, now, uh, it, it's the kind of thing that has to be done. In a living, breathing city, it's the kind of thing that has to be done. Not always. Some buildings are far too important to let this happen to them. But on Second Avenue, it, it has to be done. So was it done well or was it done badly? And I would argue that in this instance, it was done well because we can still read the original house very clearly out of what is there. It's not like that CVS was strapped across the whole front of the house, which would have more or less ruined it. Uh, it works. It still, it still works. Um, this is a rare house on 2nd Avenue that evidently was favored by God. Uh, because it has no uh, retail appendage uh, to it. Um, that's a very, very unusual thing. So let us be happy for this. This is the Ralph Mead, a commission merchant on South Street. He was and Van Wick house. Um, and it is a Greek revival house. This is much like the houses on Washington Square North the very grandest Greek revival houses had these fully modeled columns, not the boxy pilasters, which we find on 99% of Greek revival houses, but the fully modeled columns. That was expensive, that was really fancy. This was a really, really fancy house. Uh, this is the much more modest kind of Greek revival house of the 1830s with the boxy pilasters, that almost uh, vestigial sort of temple front. Uh, but what's interesting about this house is that the builder had two lots, he built two houses, and he decided to put the stoop of one on the right and the stoop of the other on the left, and thereby create what looked like a single very large, almost mansion scale structure with a central entrance, although it is in fact two houses. This is what once was Cafe Le Metro, uh, which no one here remembers. It was only around for a couple of years, but it's where the poetry project began before it moved to St. Mark's Church. In any event, uh, this is another example of a beautiful house, and this one, the home of Sir Roderick Cameron. A sir lived in this house, an English knight uh, uh, who was also a very prosperous New York City merchant. And he lived in this house for an unusually long time. He was still throwing parties in this house that were like written up in the society pages of the daily newspapers as late as 1885, when the neighborhood all around him had changed utterly. This was no longer a fancy neighborhood, but someone forgot to tell him. And he just uh, stayed on until one day, uh, I presume it was his kids said to him, Dad, you've got to move out of this neighborhood. This neighborhood has become awful. I mean, my God, I mean, look at all these Germans, for God's sake. Uh, and so Sir Roderick moved to Murray Hill and then died. So, you know, he, uh, evidently, he obviously liked living here. And then later on, it became a cafe. It's currently the 13th Step Bar and Grill. But uh, again, just like that one that has the CVS in it, we can read the old house out of it, the very grand old house. And although it's difficult to tell from a photograph like this, this is an, and I think I said this, an unusually wide house. This is like 32 feet. Um, this I uh, love because it's a Thomas E. Davis house on 7th Street, 1835. But the owner decided to jazz it up. 
in the 1850s or 1860s. We don't know for certain, but that's when it would have happened that he stuck on these window pediments and a new cornice in an effort to sort of make this Greek revival house look a little bit more up to date, a little bit more Italianate, which was the fashion of the day. And speaking of Italianate, that is the Italian Renaissance inspired. Um, style that emerged in the 1850s and 60s and supplanted the Greek revival. The East Village has some good examples of this, the so-called quote-unquote Renwick Triangle. Uh, someone at some point suggested that maybe these houses were designed by the great James Renwick. No uh, evidence of this at all thus the quotes, but the houses are very nice. Uh, they are very narrow houses, and some of them are ridiculously shallow as well. Nonetheless, uh, they do sort of tick all the boxes with the rusticated stonework and the brackets and uh, what have you, so that they are nice. And one of these houses, 118 East 10th Street, once numbered 186, was the boyhood and teenage home of the architect Stanford White, whose father, who lived in this house, Richard Grant White, was one of the eminent men of letters in mid-19th century New York. A really very interesting man, an interesting writer, who throughout his life was incredibly bitter over the fact that he made no money. Uh, and was incredibly bitter over the fact that he had to live among all these Germans. And he was a sort of really viciously anti-German. I think it would have helped his happiness a lot if he had come to love the German people. But in any event, uh, here are two remarkably narrow, 12 feet 9 inches wide. Now, for those of you who are not row house dwellers in New York, you may not really ever think about, oh, what's wide, what's narrow. But New York is, in general, uh, mapped into uniform building lots that are 20 to 25 feet wide and 100 feet deep. Uh, so most row houses are 20 to 25 feet wide. Anything wider than 25 feet we call wide. <laughs> and anything narrower than 20 feet we call narrow. And if it's 12 feet 9 inches, we call it, we have a word for this, Lilliputian. <laughs> uh, these houses are simply not wide enough for many normal Americans of today, um, that you just, they're, they're really, really narrow. Uh, now, this is a, a row of these narrow houses on 11th Street, and part of the same row, two houses were purchased and turned into a single uh, apartment uh, building. Uh, in 1967. And an architectural firm, actually a fairly prominent firm, called Wexler and Cimenti. I mean, this was just like a, a throwaway job for them, I'm sure, because they were Bernard Spitzer's architects. And they did like big apartment buildings um, on you know, Central Park South and Fifth Avenue and so on. So what are they doing? Um, with this, like I said, it was just probably just a, a job, that's all. But they were asked to combine these two houses and make them into an apartment building. And when you first look at this facade, uh, you might think, uh, is this like a 1980s postmodernist mannerism? No, it's, it's, it's another genre, what we call 1960s carelessness. <laughs> uh, 
it, 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 sort of, it sort of makes you crazy looking at this facade. First of all, uh, the architects thought, oh, there are a lot of old houses around here. So we're going to do like a, an old timey thing. We're going to give it like a colonial entrance. Because uh, obviously these surrounding houses are from the colonial period, they, they were thinking. I mean, this is like George Washington must have like, been here. So they gave it a colonial entrance. And what, 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 what always gets me about this is, is why the entrance is just kind of like off center. That's that whole 1980s kind of thing. Like, it would have been done deliberately like that in the 1980s, just because, right? Uh, but I don't think, I think here they just, they weren't even looking. Uh, and uh, and, and, and there, there you have it. Now this is really interesting. This is a Gothic revival brownstone. Uh, Gothic is a very unusual choice for New York City row houses. Not unheard of, but very rare. Uh, probably fewer than 1%, literally fewer than 1% of our row houses are Gothic Revival. Uh, here's one. And when the Landmarks Preservation Commission was considering this house a few years ago, um, they uh, were considering it primarily because it had been the home for four years, as you can see, uh, of uh, Charlie Parker of the, the great Charlie Parker, right? Uh, but they were thinking, but it was only four years. And, um, but then they put that together with the fact that it's a rare Gothic Revival brownstone. Maybe not such a great building that would have been designated solely on its architectural merits, but you take what architectural merits it has and then add the Charlie Parker merits and you know what? You have enough points. Uh, and it was designated as a landmark. That said, Charlie Parker and his wife are com common law. You know, we don't say common law wife anymore, do we? I, I read too many old books uh, that that phrase should just come naturally to my lips. I'm sorry. It just doesn't sound very 2019. But he and his common law wife, Chan Berg, lived in this house for four years, their two children together were born in this house, and their daughter, Pre, died in this house when she was two years old. Uh, what's more, um, Charlie lived in this house when he was making some of the best music of his career, including that legendary concert at Massey Hall in Toronto. This is the album. Uh, it was takes a little bit of nerve to issue an album and call it the greatest jazz concert ever, but it's uh, definitely a five-star album. But look at what it says. Jazz at Massey Hall, Dizzy Gillespie, Bud Powell, Max Roach, Charlie Mingus, Legends All, and Charlie Chan? Well, you know, when he made the album, uh, he was contractually obligated not to use his real name, because he was under contract with another label. And so he used his wife's name. She was known as Chan, and he called himself Charlie Chan. This is a real collector's item, by the way. And you know, when he lived in the East Village, he lived on Avenue B. You know, it was mostly an Eastern European neighborhood. And he once uh, wrote in a letter that he had found a Romanian restaurant that he really loved because the band, which was a Romanian Jewish band, he said, and I quote, swings more than we ever did. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is one of the great lost houses of the East Village. This was the home of the East Village's richest resident ever, Peter Gerard Stuyvesant, said in his day to be the second richest man in New York after John Jacob Astor. He died, left this house to a great nephew, who was only five, who then, uh, you know, let his father live in it. Um, and the father was the great lawyer and astronomer, Lewis Morris Rutherford, for whom the observatory at Columbia University is named. 
And uh, the house was then, in 1885, converted into apartments. And when it was apartments, it was the home of one of the greatest New Yorkers, most New Yorkers have never heard of, Colonel George Waring, who was uh, the man who designed all the water systems of Central Park, but who also, from 1895 to 97, was the greatest sanitation commissioner in the city's history. We could use him today. Um, now, the neighborhood became, and you probably already know this, German. Uh, it became part of Klein Deutschland, a uh, little Germany, which stretched roughly from Grand Street on the south to 14th, maybe 18th Street on the north, Bowery to the East River, a big swath of Manhattan. Uh, goodness gracious, but remember that in 1855, one in five New Yorkers was born in the German states. So the German population was enormous in New York City. And there are so many wonderful reminders of Klein Deutschland days as we walk around the East Village and we see the German words on buildings, like Freie Bibliothek und Lesehalle on what is now the Ottendorfer branch of the New York Public Library. That is a free library and reading room. And next door to it, the Deutsches Dispensary. These wonderful buildings by the German-born architect William Schickel were built 1883-84, and the Deutsches Dispensary, later Stuyvesant Polyclinic, is especially great for this wonderful terracotta sculpture of medical luminaries such as Galen and the god Esculapius and the beautiful ornament and so on. And then on uh, 4th Street, a building which is now La Mama, uh, is uh, the former Russian Brutalverein, uh, which later became uh, the Gesamtverein Schillerbund, uh, which was a both of them musical societies. Before the German immigration, which began following the failed revolution of 1848, New York City had music, but it wasn't any good. Okay. After the Germans came, New York music became as good as any music in the world. And by the end of the 19th century, there were years in which literally every single player in the New York Philharmonic was German, which, you know, which is why we should not be surprised that their repertory was wholly German. Anyway, societies like this provided those musicians. And uh, if you are, as I am, deeply interested in the musical landmarks of New York, a building such as this ranks in the 99th percentile. The busts on the outside are, it is said, of Mendelssohn, Mozart, and Beethoven, and that's pretty great to have them looking down on you. By the way, it's going to be restored to its original appearance. Nice, huh? This is the Deutsche Amerikanische Schützen uh, Geselschaft. What does that mean? Shooting society. Because the one thing the Germans liked as much as music was shooting. And here they would go and they would shoot. But what's wonderful is, again, the German words that remain on the outside of this designated landmark building. Right outside of here um, is the German church, the German cathedral, it's been called, uh, Most Holy Redeemer. This is what it looked like when it was first built in 1852, but they decided to remodel in 1913, simplifying the design. It's still a beautiful church. I think it was probably more beautiful before they redesigned it. And it reminds us that church, which is Roman Catholic, does, that the original German immigrants to New York were Roman Catholic, but later German immigrants, because the Germans never stopped immigrating, uh, were Lutheran. And this was the major Lutheran church in the neighborhood, St. Mark's, 
on East 7th Street, and who knows what we associate this church with. Yeah, the General Slocum disaster of June 15th, 1904, because this was the church that organized that excursion in which 1,300 plus members of the community, women and children, took the steamboat General Slocum to what was supposed to be a picnic in Long Island. And we all know what happened. More than 1,000 of them died, and they are commemorated in New York City only by this very meager fountain in Tompkins Square. It remains to this day one of the great mysteries why the single greatest loss of New Yorkers' lives before 9-11 should be so meagerly commemorated. The answer would really be that those who were affected wished to forget. Um, and uh, this is really all we have. By the way, I wonder how many of you know that the General Slocum disaster is mentioned in James Joyce's Ulysses. Um, which is set on June 16, 1904. But uh, here you see a uh, terrible affair, that General Slocum explosion, terrible, terrible, etc. But uh, just in case you were wondering if James Joyce had a connection with the East Village, yes, he does. Now, the East Village is also known for its tenements pre-old law tenements, meaning tenements built before the Tenement House Act of 1879, meaning basically, for all intents and purposes, tenements built before any regulation of tenement design. Uh, the most famous pre-old law tenement in the city is 97 Orchard Street, 1863, but the East Village has what could just as easily have been the Lower East Side Tenement Museum in 1863, tenement at 143 East 13th Street. When we look at these buildings, what's I think most remarkable for many of us in 2019 is how rich the terracotta ornamentation on their exteriors is. These buildings were built for the poorest of the city's poor, and yet, uh, the buildings are richly decorated. This is, you know, the $64,000 question uh, among architecture buffs in New York City. Why? Why was the effort taken to ornament these buildings? And uh, in this case, not only ornamented, but the very careful way in which the brick and the mortar and the terracotta is uh, so beautifully made it. You know, there's a building uh, a few years after this, the Brooklyn Historical Society, which is celebrated for doing exactly what the architect of this tenement building did with his choices of brick, mortar, and terracotta. And yet, uh, this building gets very little acknowledgement in that regard, unfortunate, but again, what is the reason for the careful design of the facades of a building that was built for the very poor, built basically to warehouse the very poor. You'd think that the building would be utterly utilitarian, and yet it is not. My own answer, glib though it may sound, is that back then it simply didn't occur to anyone that there could be such a thing as a building without ornament. I mean, uh, any more so than that there could be a building without four walls. Um, and we see it again in 101 Avenue A, the building which later became the Pyramid Club, uh, a building which is amazingly intact. How buildings like this make it through their entire histories with so little in the way of alteration, down to the storefronts, which unfortunately you can't really make out in the photo, but take my word for it, down to the storefront is something, nothing less than miraculous. Now, there, were, uh, there was the Tenement House Law of 1879, which mandated air shafts, that great innovation that wasn't. 
Uh, air shafts were meant to bring light and air into the interior rooms of apartments. They ended up becoming kind of garbage chutes, and uh, it was a, a kind of non-solution to the horrors of tenement life. There's an air shaft. Um, but these old law tenements are abundant in the East Village. They are everywhere. Because during the period that this law was in effect, 1879 to 1901, roughly a billion apartment buildings were built in New York City. Uh, that's not a billion, just a, a lot. A lot of buildings were built. And this is my favorite old law tenement in the city. Why? Uh, this is a testament to the human spirit, this building is. Uh, this is uh, 66 East 7th Street, George F. Pelham, a very good designer of apartment buildings uh, in the city. But what I love about this building, I showed you this one earlier, right? Do you remember that? This is a, a Thomas E. Davis row house that had the, the remodeling job done mid-century. So Pelham, the architect of this building, a tenement for the very poor, decides to give his buildings these pedimented lintels that echo the ones on the much older house next door. A house that was built half a century, or got its pedimented lintels half a century earlier. He did that. And what I love about that is that he didn't need to do that. I would wager everything I own, uh, family members included, <laughs> that, that, that the builder, the developer, didn't ask him to do that. That he took it upon himself to do that because, you know what, he was an architect. And although most of what he designed was speculative garbage, Nonetheless, he wanted to pay homage to that old house next door. And he did it, and he did it far, far more intelligently than Wexler and Cimenti did in that thing that we saw a little while ago. Uh, Charles B. Myers was one of the most prolific architects of his generation, designed buildings of all kinds, including the main building of Yeshiva University. But mostly what he designed were tenements like this one on 2nd Avenue and 9th Street. And you see here that it has the air shaft, but because it's a corner building, it doesn't have to have one on the street side. This is 226 East 13th Street. Uh, and I'm wondering if anyone here knows what this building is famous for. Anyone? No. No. Yes. No. No. <laughs> uh, well, here we can see from the real estate map the air shafts. It's the building from Taxi Driver, people. Uh, now, now, if you. If you remember the movie, um, and everyone does, uh, because of when I moved to New York, when people ask me why I live in New York, I always say, you know, I was in graduate school, and I, I went to see Taxi Driver, and I, I said to myself, yeah, that's where I want to live. Uh, and, I, and I moved right there. But, but in that film, Scorsese, uh, Hey, uh, yeah, we have a, okay, well, while that's being fixed, oh, there we go. He, he very slowly pans up the facade of this building, and it is so ominous. And you, you think, you realize there's nothing he could have, like, uh, filmed in that way that would be more ominous than a run-down New York old law tenement. 
uh, in the 1970s when these buildings really were run down, people. It was run down. And it just, it frightens you. Just that slow pan up the front of this building just sets you on edge. You know that something like bloody is going to take place. And of course, it, it does. You know, uh, Travis Bickle goes in, the climactic shoot up at the end, uh, you know, uh, takes place in this building. But it was one of the first things I looked for when I moved to New York. Uh, uh, anyway, the, uh, there's the L, which went up First Avenue. And this map shows us the population density, uh, where you see the darker areas. Those are the more densely populated parts of the city. And you look at the city as a whole in 1894, and goodness gracious, this really stands out. Well, it's the Lower East Side in general, but it also includes the two wards, the 11th and the 17th, that made up what we call the East Village, which were incredibly densely populated. I don't want to kind of like get into all the, the numbers right there, but in 1901, the city or the state of New York enacted the Tenement House Act of 1901, which uh, actually was a very significant piece of housing legislation, making tenements truly livable for the first time. And it did so by requiring much larger outdoor areas, not just the air shafts, but a considerably greater amount of space around the buildings, and making it very, very difficult for builders to build tenements on single 25-foot wide lots. It was much easier in meeting the requirements of the law to build on multiples of those lots, and as a result, you can outwardly tell a new law tenement from an old law, sometimes just by its size. If it's a double lot width building or very frequently a very big building on a corner, most of the corners of the East Village are anchored by new law tenements. What I like about this one, designed by that same fella who did the echoes of the lintels of the house next door, George F. Pelham, is that you look at this tenement from 1902 and you see how remarkably similar it is to the luxury apartment house he designed in Brooklyn Heights in 1911. Same formal vocabulary, same basic disposition of elements, etc., etc. Here's a corner new law tenement. Bernstein and Bernstein were prolific tenement designers. This is 192nd Avenue. And some old tenements were in the 1930s convert, uh, uh, renovated and converted into the city's first housing project, known as the First Houses. And given a very generous courtyard showing what could be done with these old tenements if a little imagination was applied. Now back to 192nd Avenue. This introduces us to the Eastern European Jewish phase in the neighborhood's history, because this was the building where the Café Royal was located. Um, it was there from 1908 to 1952, and thank God there were no blogs in 1952, because my God, the hand wringing over the closing of the Café Royal would have been unendurable. Uh, the, uh, but, uh, indeed, this was one of the most famous restaurants in the city's history, the Hangout, the C and B scene, uh, uh, place for uh, the, the, the luminaries of the Yiddish theater and for the city's Jewish intelligentsia in general. Right across the street from it, speaking of the Yiddish theater as our greatest surviving landmark of the glory days of the Yiddish theater, don't forget, everybody, that Yiddish became a literary language in New York. It had not been in Europe, but it became one in New York. And it was 
the, the impresario Maurice Schwartz, who built the Yiddish art theater, was one of the, the major figures in that movement to make Yiddish a literary language. And this is a designated landmark, now a multiplex cinema, but still a wonderful building. Great star of the Yiddish stage who appeared at the Yiddish Art Theater, Molly Pecan, just like to show slides of her. And this is the Hebrew Actors Union, where the performers along the Jewish Rialto, as Second Avenue was once known, um, sort of uh, conducted their business affairs in a building that I think is, is quite a lovely building by Victor Maper. And the greatest reminders of all that we possess of the Jewish days of the East Village are the synagogues. But what's interesting is that there are no grand synagogues in the East Village, unlike to the south of here. Uh, rather, we have what are called tenement synagogues or row house synagogues. Synagogues that were either built on 25 foot wide lots or actually converted out of row houses. And sometimes they were converted or built spectacularly. Uh, like uh, Beth Hamadrash Hagadol on Shaungan uh, on East 7th Street. The architects were tenement architects but they put a care into the design of the synagogues that was really special. Again, tenement architect Hermann Hornberger, this is one of the most beautiful buildings in the East Village and what we call a tenement synagogue. The city's first apartment house for the middle class was on 18th Street, but the East Village got a few as well. Uh, George B. Post's 206 to 208 East 9th Street is a really lovely building. But what I want to talk about here, and by way of making our way towards the finale, is the gentrification of the East Village. If you think that that started in the 1980s, you're wrong. The 1920s was a very prosperous decade in New York. And it was a decade of ferocious gentrification. Working class neighborhoods were transformed into upper class neighborhoods one after the other, and almost overnight. Sutton Place, Beekman Place, East End Avenue, big parts of Greenwich Village, Chelsea, etc., etc., etc. And right at the end of the decade, everyone had his sights on the East Village it was going to be the next upper-class neighborhood. Uh, never mind that it was a largely very poor, largely Jewish immigrant neighborhood. So what? It was conveniently located. And developers moved in. They built luxury high-rise buildings like the Peter Stuyvesant on 2nd Avenue and 11th Street, which occupied the site that had been the New York Historical Society. And right next to the New York Historical Society was a beautiful church, the Baptist Tabernacle. There is the demolition of the Baptist Tabernacle, there's the Peter Stuyvesant, and there's the building that replaced the Baptist Tabernacle. It was Warren Hall, designed by Emery Roth, another luxury high-rise. But when the church sold the site to the developer, they required that a new church be built in its base. And what is now the entrance to Urban Outfitters, well, at least it's not CVS, was, uh, was originally the Gothic arched entrance to the new church. Anyway, this is uh, what a real estate brochure for the building said. This is the language of gentrification, people. In the heart of the old aristocratic Stuyvesant and Astor Place section, a new and distinctive residential neighborhood is rapidly springing up. This district, so rich in city tradition, is once more coming into prominence as a desirable location for the modern home. Yikes. And then it goes on. The building will be completed in... <laughs> October 1929. 
So guess what? The gentrification stalled out. And that's why we think it didn't begin until the 1980s, because that's when it picked up again. But before, when the gentrification bug was still in the air, right across the street from the Baptist Tabernacle was St. Mark's in the Bowery. And its pastor, William Norman Guthrie, wanted to cash in on this real estate boom. Who didn't? But he couldn't tear down his church. It was too historic. So he got an idea. He had all this land around the church, you know, this, 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 like, this graveyard, right? And, and he figured, what if I develop all the land around the church and leave the church standing? So he was a progressive man. He hired Frank Lloyd Wright. And this was Wright's design for high rises surrounding their St. Mark's in the Bowery. This was on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, but again, it unfortunately ran right into the crash. And these were never built. But Wright used the design later for his Price Tower in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, 1952 to 56. That's more or less what those St. Mark's high rises would look like. And this is an unusual building to show in reference to the gentrification of the East Village in the 20s. Uh, this is Christodora House. It's a settlement house. You don't build settlement houses in gentrifying neighborhoods. But this was no ordinary settlement house. Christodora House had been there for a long time and had been in converted row houses. And then they got the idea, because of the real estate market, that they could do a kind of Baptist tabernacle thing. They could build a high-rise apartment hotel and put the settlement house in, in it, in part of it, and make a ton of money off the rest. Great idea, but unfortunately ran into the crash. And they never made the money they thought they were going to make. And within 20 years, they abandoned the building. Uh, this is, by the way, just some old Christodora house photos. And uh, then it was turned into a, a luxury conversion in the 1980s. I just, you know, it's Iggy Pop. Uh, uh, he lived, the, he bought an apartment there. Uh, that's, I just have to show a picture of Iggy Pop in every lecture. Anyway, uh, now, uh, this is St. Bridget's Church. Oh, and, and you know, Christodora House in the 80s became a lightning rod of discontent. And something on that in a, in a second. St. Bridget's Church was designed by Patrick C. Keeley, the most prolific architect of Roman Catholic churches in North American history, 1848. Frank O'Hara could see it from his apartment. How funny you are today, New York, like Ginger Rogers in swing time and St. Bridget's steeple leaning a little to the left. This was Frank O'Hara's building on uh, 9th Street, right there. Second floor. There's Frank O'Hara, second floor of the building on 9th Street. And anyway, uh, St. Bridget's, as you probably know, uh, had a dwindling congregation. The church was shuttered by the archdiocese. And because the archdiocese of New York is so unusually successful at preventing its buildings from being landmarked, they were going to pull it down. And then, miraculously, an anonymous donor came forward with $20 million. And just in case you're wondering, that's a lot. Uh, and the church was reopened and restored in what is a rare, happy story, period. We don't have many happy stories uh, these days, but there you are. Who was the anonymous donor? Uh, no one knows, but some speculate it was Mike Bloomberg. Uh, anyway, that 
anonymous donor did not come forward to save Mary Hope of Christians. When I was working on the report for GVSHP, I made the what was for me wonderful discovery that this church was designed by the Italian-born architect Nicholas Saracino. Uh, nobody had ever read page two of the Department of Buildings report on this building before. Seriously, nobody had, because every book listed somebody named Domenico Briganti as the architect of this building, but if you read page two, uh, you'd find that Briganti's building was never built and Saracino's building was built instead. Uh, always read the whole report. Uh, the, uh, so this was sort of like the great discovery of my lifetime, the thing that I will be remembered for in my <laughs> newspaper obituaries. And in case you're wondering who the heck is Nicholas Saracino, he was the architect of the city's grandest Roman Catholic church, St. Jean Baptiste, on uh, uh, Lexington Avenue and 76th Street, a church that is almost overbearing in its uh, uh, magnificence. This was much more modest, but a beautiful classical church that served the Italian Catholics of the neighborhood, and it was wantonly demolished in 2013. Oh, forget that, forget. Now, Tompkins Square, to conclude, on the north side is the beautiful Carnegie Library, which was designed by McKinmead and White. These neighborhood libraries were all designed by name firms, like McKinmead and White, um, or uh, Babcock and Willard. And I've always loved this library uh, being sort of a buff of historical printing. I love that it has the printer's marks of the Aldean Press and the Plantin Press and in the middle, the seal of the city of New York. I loved that those uh, seals that uh, tell us so much about Western civilization looked down on the sidewalks that teemed with the immigrant children who came to use this library. I find that sort of thing so intensely moving. It can make me cry. Uh, and the building itself is very handsome. Right behind it on 11th Street is the one and only building in the East Village we might call a bazaar extravaganza. And it is, wouldn't you know it, a public bath. You know, in the, back in the day, people took their baths in public baths. And I've always thought that nothing says Hello, neighbor, quite like a public <laughs> bath. Uh, but, um, the, uh, but, but there is the free public bath on 11th Street designed by the great Arnold W. Brunner, the architect of congregation Sheriff Israel on Central Park West and 70th Street. And here you have the cabochons and scroll frames, the rustication, the balustrade, it's really a very beautiful building. And right across the street from it is an old church. It was originally the 11th Street Methodist Episcopal Church, built 1867 to 68, but it was remodeled uh, in 1901 by two architects, Louis Gelad and Don Barber, who were major architects. And they gave this Romanesque revival building these weirdly uh, Beaux-Arts classical details that somehow unbelievably work to create a building that just cannot be placed, uh, but is a delight to look at, and uh, a delight not least of all because it has the most fabulous Jesus Saves sign on it, and I wonder what the Landmarks Commission would do if a new owner wanted to take that down. Uh, I bet they would allow it, and yet it is just the thing that makes this building ultra fabulous. Uh, I, I love that sign. To me, uh, it might be the one thing in the East Village that I would save if I could save one thing. Now, this is Tompkins Square uh, with St. Bridget's. This is from uh, Hearth and Home Magazine, in an article about poor people's parks. And there they are, poor people. This is what they look like. 
Uh, now, in 1874, uh, uh, things got tense in Tompkins Square because there had been, as you probably know, a depression, or there was a depression on at the time, Panic of 1873, and uh, the, uh, there was a tremendous fear among elite New Yorkers that the, about something like the Paris Commune, which was very recent, happening in New York. Thus, when working people gathered in Tompkins Square to march down to City Hall to protest the bad economic conditions, the police wouldn't have it. They dispersed the men violently in what is justly called a police riot. This is a lovely print showing a concert in the square in 1891. This is 1903, 1915. Robert Moses had at Tompkins Square between 36 and 42, gave it the layout that we have today. This is all the handiwork of Robert Moses. He's the author of the current Tompkins Square. There's Congressman Samuel Cox, known as the letter carrier's friend. The worst statue in North America. It, it is, I mean, hands down, the worst statue in North America. And there's Jack Kerouac. Uh, Tompkins Square became sort of the epicenter of the hippie scene in New York City in the 60s, but that was short-lived because the neighborhood people didn't like the hippies, particularly uh, teenage Eastern European males didn't like the hippies and were sometimes very rough with them. So the hippies left New York in disgust and despair. Uh, and then, of course, the great riot, August 6th to 7th, 1988, when um, feelings about gentrification and the changes that were overcoming the East Village intensified and protesting turned raucous and the police came in and, you know, this is borne out by videotape, uh, behaved rather like the police of 1873 in what has been officially branded a police riot. But only, there we are, only three or four weeks later, weak stock took place as normal in Tompkins Square. And you'd hardly know that the police riot had taken place there, uh, only, uh, a f really a few weeks earlier. This is Tompkins Square today, and like everything else in New York, it's like dominated by sprawling millennials. Uh, it, it's, I mean, just people just, just lie down wherever they are in the city these days. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't get it. Back in my day, you never did that. Uh, you just kept moving. Uh, but, but that's not how the young use the city today. And if, uh, so this was uh, actually just a very uh, sort of brief look at, I know it didn't seem brief, but believe me, it was brief look at uh, some of the, the sort of historical currents that go through the East Village. I could have done a talk uh, showing 117 slides of something entirely different, because the East Village is, I think, probably the richest, certainly the weirdest neighborhood <laughs> in New York City, and I urge you all to download or purchase the report, and I thank you all for coming. <laughs>